The portion of God's Word that will guide our thoughts this morning comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And I'll read the whole lesson. Only one verse is projected on the screen, but we haven't heard it yet, so I'll read the whole lesson. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now, Finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be equality. As it is written, He who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. This is God's Word. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Dear fellow recipients of Christ's riches, Evelyn Adams defied all the odds. She won the lottery back to back. Evelyn Adams won the lottery both in 1985 and 1986 for a combined winning of $5.6 million. But then the luck went to Evelyn's head. She figured she was on a streak, so she was bound to win more, so she took all her winnings to the tables and slot machines of Atlantic City. And she gambled it all away. Today... She's penniless. Louise White was a little more intelligent with her winnings. She won the Powerball back in 2012 for $336 million. Right before she bought the winning lottery ticket, she had bought some rainbow sherbet ice cream at the grocery store. So, in honor of the lucky dessert, she set up a trust fund and called it the Rainbow Sherbet Trust Fund. That trust fund now benefits Louise's family. Vivian Nicholas was a little more selfish with her winnings. She won a British lottery back in 1961 that would be worth about five million dollars today. Immediately she went out and bought a bunch of fancy dresses and she bought a couple of luxury cars. Then she went and traveled America and traveled Britain. Today her closet is full of nice clothes but her wallet is empty. All of these stories of lottery winners come from an article in Business Insider. Now I wonder, if you won the lottery, what would Business Insider write about you? Would there be a story about how you gave it all away to charity? Would there be a story about how you squandered it all away on luxury items and services? Would there be a story about how you became a smart business person and invested your money in some companies that earned you more money? 
what would Business Insider write about you if you won the lottery? That's a good question for us to consider. Because the Apostle Paul is going to tell us today that we all have won the lottery. We have won the spiritual lottery. And the Apostle Paul is going to encourage us to be dear givers. You won the lottery. Be a dear giver. Our reading for today comes from the book of 2 Corinthians. In this portion of God's Word, the Apostle Paul is encouraging the Corinthians to give some money to a special offering. This special offering was dedicated to the Christians in Jerusalem. You see, the Christians in Jerusalem were suffering. There had been a big famine, so all the people of Jerusalem were suffering. And not only that, but the people in Jerusalem often suffered from poverty because the Christians were ostracized. The Jews who didn't believe in Jesus ostracized the Christians, so it was kind of hard for the Christians to earn a living. So the Apostle Paul writes letters to the churches that he had started, and he travels to those churches and encourages them to give an offering to help the suffering Christians in Jerusalem. Right before our reading for today, Paul says that he had just been to Macedonia. And the Macedonians had given generously to this offering even though that they themselves were kind of poor. They gave generously to this offering. Then, in our reading, Paul gives the Corinthians the ultimate motivation for giving. Our reading starts out like this. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. Right off the bat, Paul tells the Corinthians and us something about Christian giving. He says, I'm not commanding you. Christian giving is not something that is forced or that is done grudgingly. Paul says, I'm not going to command you. That's not how Christian giving works. He tells the Corinthians, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. When I first read that, I didn't like it. Paul is talking about comparing the Corinthians and the Macedonians. Remember, he had just talked about the Macedonians before our reading. He says, I want to compare the earnestness of your love, or I want to test the earnestness of your love by comparing it with that of others. It sounds like Paul is saying, hey, these guys gave a lot. Are these guys better than you? We need to keep in mind, though, that Paul never mentions a dollar amount. He never says, these guys gave a thousand bucks. Are you going to match it? No, rather, Paul is talking about an attitude of the heart. The Macedonians gave generously and willingly Paul is holding them up as an example of what kind of attitude Christians have when they give. And Paul is certain that the Corinthians have that same attitude because he knows that they're lottery winners. Our reading goes on. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. When encouraging Christian giving, the Apostle Paul points to the ultimate example. He points to Jesus. Jesus was rich. Jesus had wealth that we can hardly even imagine. First, Jesus, the Son of God, was 
all-powerful. He could create things with a simple word. Jesus was also omniscient. That means he was all-knowing. He knew all the secrets and intricacies of the universe. Jesus was also immortal. He wasn't subject to death and sorrow and pain and suffering. Jesus also had the perfect relationship with God the Father. He and God the Father lived in perfect happiness together. Jesus was rich. He had all of those things. And our scripture for today says, He became poor. All those things that I mentioned, Jesus gave up. He set them aside. He became poor. When Jesus was on this earth, he set aside his almighty power. If he wanted to create something, he had to get his carpenter dad to help him out. Jesus also set aside his omniscience, his all-knowing. While he was on this earth, he had to learn and grow just like we do. Jesus also set aside his immortality. He made himself subject to pain and sorrow and grief and death. Jesus also set aside his perfect relationship with the Heavenly Father. Jesus set all that aside. He became poor. And why did he do that? He did that so you could become rich. Jesus set aside his almighty power so that he could live like one of us and fulfill God's law perfectly. Jesus set aside his immortality so that he could suffer and die to save us from our sins. Jesus set aside his perfect relationship with the Heavenly Father so that he could take our broken relationship, suffer the consequences, and then give you his perfect relationship with the Father. Jesus set aside all his riches so that he could make you rich. You are lottery winners. You're going to go to heaven. You have a perfect relationship with God the Father. You are a loved child of God. Jesus gave all that to you. You are a lottery winner. When encouraging Christian giving, the Apostle Paul points us to Jesus and he shows us the wonderful riches that we have been given. You won the lottery, so be a dear giver. After pointing the Corinthians and us to Jesus, the Apostle Paul goes on to describe some principles of Christian giving. We'll use the word dear as an acronym to summarize the principles that Paul is going to mention. We go on, we go on in our reading. And here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. D is the first letter in our acronym. D stands for desire. Our desire to give comes from Christ's gift to us and the riches that Christ has given us. Paul saw that desire in the Corinthians. The Corinthians knew about Jesus and all the gifts he had given them, so they desired to give because of Jesus. D stands for desire. Our reading goes on. Now, finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it. E stands for execute. Not in the sense of putting someone to death, but in the sense of putting a plan into action. The Apostle Paul saw that the Corinthians were willing to give, so he encourages them to take that desire to the next step. He encourages them to actually execute, put a plan into action, actually carry out the giving. 
When we want to give a gift, we need to make sure we execute. This requires some planning. We need to sit down and look at how much we have, how much we make. We need to decide how much we're going to give, and then we actually need to carry out the process of giving. When thinking about Christian giving, we need to make sure we execute. E stands for execute. Our reading goes on. According to your means, for if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. A in our acronym stands for according to your means. When thinking about Christian giving, the amount really doesn't matter. What matters is the willingness of the heart. The $1 bill given by a 10-year-old out of his allowance is just as acceptable and pleasing to God as the $100,000 given by a billionaire. The amount doesn't matter. What matters is the willingness of the heart. If we want to think about an amount, how much we should give, the Apostle Paul tells us, according to your means, according to what you have, not according to what you don't have. You give according to your means. When I read this, it made me think of Betty. Betty's not her real name. We'll call her Betty for our purposes today. Betty had not been to church in a while. So Betty's pastor went and visited her. Betty's pastor asked Betty about why she had been absent from church. And with tears in her eyes, Betty said, Pastor, I haven't been to church because I'm so embarrassed that I can't give anything in offering. I get so ashamed when the plate is passed by and I never put anything in. You see, Betty was a single mom. And she worked long hours and she worked very hard so that she could put her daughter through a Christian school. In reality, Betty had nothing to be ashamed of. She was already doing a very good and God-pleasing thing by dedicating her money to the Christian education of her daughter. She had no reason to be ashamed. She needed to be told, we give according to what we have, not according to what we don't have. At this point in life, she didn't have anything else to give. Maybe when her daughter went to a public high school, then she could give some in offering, But at this point in time, she had nothing to be ashamed of. She was dedicating a lot of her income to the Christian education of her daughter. We give according to what we have, not according to what we don't have. We give according to our means. A stands for according to our means. Our reading goes on. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be equality. As it is written, He who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. R stands for reciprocal. Our Christian giving is reciprocal. In a Christian community, we take care of each other. Paul tells the Christians at Corinth that you guys have plenty right now. These guys are suffering. You guys have the ability to help them out. In a Christian community, we take care of each other. And often, our giving is reciprocal. We may not always receive money in return for our Christian giving, but often we'll receive something else from the Christian community, whether it's a kind word or some other act of love. In a Christian community, we take care of each other. Our giving is reciprocal. Be dear 
givers, brothers and sisters. D stands for desire. Your desire comes from the riches that Christ has given you. E stands for execute. When you want to give, make sure you take that desire a step further and actually execute your plan to give. A stands for according to your means. You give according to what you have with the financial blessings that God has given you, not according to what you don't have. R stands for reciprocal. In a Christian community, we take care of each other. And when you're thinking about Christian giving, always remember, you are a lottery winner. You have been given Christ's riches, a gift more valuable than any Powerball. Amen.